I almost forgot that I was going to be talking. I was so impressed with all the speakers this morning and this afternoon. <laughs> okay, so as you know, I started my business when I was 12. Uh, back then, I would get on my bike after school, and I'd ride out into town and go to the electrical stalls, and I'd pick up loudspeakers and put them in my backpack and ride back home, and I'd just repair them. I, would, I don't know how I'd do it. I'd take them apart, and I'd look inside at the coils and the magnets, and... I just wanted to repair these things, and I enjoyed it. I loved repairing loudspeakers. It just so happened that um, I got paid for it as well. So I kept doing it right the way through high school. And here I am 29 years later, almost 30 years later, still in business, still doing things that I absolutely love doing. But anybody who, and I'm sure there are people here who've been in business for many, many years, more than, more than myself, and they would have experienced the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, and I've surely um, have been on those sort of journeys. But I've also managed to answer some really interesting questions. So I've got a question for you guys today. What could a loudspeaker, a bird, and a volcano ever have in common? In 2001, I had a small business building speakers for the hi-fi market. And I wanted to create a loudspeaker that would create some interest, that people would get excited about, that would create some interest in our brand. So I came up with the idea of just building a massive subwoofer. I mean, we're all used to the little black ones in the corner of the room. I wanted to build something that was so big that it would make me feel small. So I came up with a name, the Bladder Buster. <laughs> because the idea of having a loudspeaker so loud that it would force fluids out of your body didn't just get me interested, it got so many other people interested that worked with me. So I just talked about it. I shared the design and I talked about it with friends and customers and people that we worked with. And until later in the year, um, we had an opportunity to demonstrate um, our loudspeaker range at a big show. Actually, it was in Auckland. Our factory was in Christchurch. And uh, they said, yep, great, we want to look, we were looking forward to seeing your whole product range. Oh, and bring that bladder buster. Now, that was great. I was so excited, except I had two problems. I'd never built one before, and I only had two weeks. So, of course, we were committed, and they'd already put advertising saying that Arvis, you know, Arvis Loudspeakers was going to bring its bladder buster. So what amazes me is that because so many other people really wanted to get involved, suddenly I started to attract all these resources. So not only did we make it work, but we made it work on time, except we had one problem. We didn't have enough time to assemble it entirely before we shipped it away. So there was the big show, and myself and about four or five other engineers worked right through the night where the speaker was going to be demonstrated at the show, putting it all together. Here's, a spe here's an image for you. There we go. Can you see? Oh, no, you can't see it. There we go. <laughs> so this here is the bladder buster, and it was on its back. We'd been working all night. I'm trying to glue the, big bit, the biggest speaker to the enclosure, and I'm shouting at the top of my lips, I need something to keep the two pieces apart so the glue can get tacky. It was, you know, contact adhesive. At that very moment, my dad walks up and goes, son, could these work? And he pulls out a packet of, a complete packet of toothpicks. So anyway, the toothpicks worked. We kept everything going. We put everything down in place. We tipped this two and a half meter um, subwoofer upright. It weighed 250 kilograms, so there was quite a few of us behind us. We turned it on worked perfectly. For three days, it seriously had a lot of people looking at it. We set off car alarms. It was just, you know, <laughs> a lot of fun. Well, that fun continued, and we ended up selling a number of these products for a number of, for the next couple of years. Actually, we've got a customer in, the, in Texas who bought one of these, and he referred a lot of business to us, and he was so proud of his bladder buster, so we gave him two monogrammed bladder busted adult diapers for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, 2000, 2003, um, 1st of April, we decided that I, I decided that we needed to up the ante. So we came up with a, a new product that we posted on the 1st of April, and that should have been an indicator. And we called it the Submageddon. And it was going to be three meters tall. It was going to have, you know, a loudspeaker at about this big, 2,000 watts. By that stage, I didn't actually know how to build these things, so I could calculate what sort of output it had. And so I put at the bottom of the page, um, and there was no image, it was just specifications. It was yet to be revealed. Um, 140 dB at 15 hertz. And if anybody's into audio, they'll know that that's um, bow, bow bursting loud. That was all great. 
But anyway, it was Sunday morning. It was actually Easter Sunday about tw uh, 20 days later. And I got out of bed and I went down to the office, as you do on Easter Sunday. And, <laughs> and for some reason, I just picked up the phone. I had no reason to, it wasn't ringing. And actually, there was somebody on the other end. This company from the US, it ended up being a big military organization, had been trying to get hold of me for 24 hours. They wanted to know if we could build a bigger subwoofer than our submageddon. <laughs> <laughs> So of course, I mean, I'm from New Zealand. Yeah, sure, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, anyway, two weeks later, we've got two designs. The first one, they had very specific specifications. It had to be of a particular size. It had to produce 145 dB at, uh, 50, at 15 hertz. It had to do various other things. Um, and uh, so we did that, and I came up with two designs. The first one, I had a lot of fun, Sonic Armageddon Noise Delivery System. <laughs> Gives you an indicator of what we were heading at. And that was just a traditional loudspeaker. But the following design was one that I was really quite excited about because it wasn't a traditional speaker, it was a different approach, and I called this You Bad. <laughs> the ultimate bass actuating device. <laughs> <laughs> well, as quickly as this opportunity came, it went. And within two weeks, uh, they said, look, we don't actually need you to do this anymore. And we'd put all this effort in. I had quite a good number of engineers, and we were quite excited. Actually, I was excited about this, not just about the technology, but I'd got involved and in, I got interested in a new, f sort of, um, a new field of sound that I didn't know anything about. And that field of sound is called infrasound. And infrasound is interesting. It's ultra low frequency sound. You can't actually hear it. And we're exposed to it all the time. It's actually, it's actually all around us all the time. And it's ex created by various events, winds, thunderstorms, volcanoes. Actually, even when a train goes into a channel, that pressure wave is actually infrasound. The other interesting thing about infrasound is that like traditional sound, it, can travel, it, it travels long distances. And those distances get longer as the frequency gets lower. Uh, the best explanation or, um, of that is we've all stood on the side of the road and we've all seen some young teenager with a shiny wheels going doof, 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 doof. Well, the re he's not listening to that. What he's listening to is probably, I don't know what he's listening to, but it's music and he's got vocals and everything. But the thing is, is the mid frequencies and the high frequencies don't travel as far. So we only hear the really low frequencies. Well, infrasound is like that, except it's a magnitude um, greater in its distance. So not only does it travel across the street, across the city, but it can actually travel hundreds of kilometers. And in actual fact, there's been recorded events from volcanoes and various nuclear explosions where the infrasound has actually circumnavigated the planet. So I got really excited about this. I thought, wow, infrasound, that's serious base. <laughs> so anyway, I had a lot of other projects on at the time. I'm best when I'm doing, I mean, you give me one task, it won't get done. But if you give me 10 or 15, yeah, they'll all get, they'll get happen. So as, we, as well as all the other things that are happening in my business, I was interested in infrasound. So I talked about this with friends and colleagues, the same process. And what was really interesting, in 2006, a friend of mine who's a diesel mechanic said to me, I've got a friend who's got a vineyard. And the vineyards, their Pinot Noir is being affected by the fact birds are eating their grapes. Could your infrasound generator maybe scare those birds away? And I thought, wow, a possible use for a not yet invented invention. I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what happens is really simple. So we build a small infrasound generator, we take it over to the field, we turn it on, nothing happens. Nothing happens at all, birds aren't interested. So I play around with different volumes and different frequencies and waveforms and we try multiples. And after quite a few months, we actually have three days where we don't have any birds in the environment whatsoever. They're all up in trees looking around, but none of them actually go to where the source of food is. So I thought, wow, this is an interesting phenomenon. I could maybe refine this. Well, at that very time, within weeks, our other technology, which was an audio system for cinema, really takes off. And I do something that I've never done before. I focus on one thing. <laughs> so I take, stop all my other projects, including this bird low sound scaring thingy and focus on the cinema technology. And in the following two or three years, things really take off and our business goes really, really well. But then an interesting event happens. I wake up one morning after uh, traveling from overseas. It's the 1st of September. I'm in a hot sweat. I'm soaking. And I've just had a dream that there's been an earthquake in Christchurch. 
So I go home, I'm sorry, I am home obviously, I go downstairs, I um, tell my wife, and then later in the day, I check my insurance, I have a glass of, I uh, check all the water in the house, batteries, and then two days later, or three days later, on the, first of, on the 4th of um, September, our house is shaken like crazy with thousands of others in Christchurch. I'm upstairs, shaking, screaming with my children, just like in the dream. Actually, the only thing that wasn't in the dream is that the lights were out and I was naked. So that's, <laughs> so that's one image my children don't have. <laughs> anyway, in, in the subsequent months and uh, many aftershocks, that, hundreds of aftershocks, um, that whole event really affects our business. And by February the following year, um, I'm looking at and starting another part of my business because the cinema industry part of our business was seriously affected. But in February, there's another event, 22nd, as people obviously know, and this time it was deadly, and uh, it felt like somebody picked up the house and just dropped it on the ground. And after those horrifying 20 seconds, my wife and I look at each other and we go, we're out of here. So 10 days later, we packed up the bit of the house, we've packed up a bit of our business, we get three children in the car, all our three children in the car. <laughs> <laughs> The three children in the car, we give them a box each and say, whatever you can fit in there, you can keep, we're out of here and we're going for a drive. So we drive all the way up the North Island, we drive up the, up the South Island, we get to the North Island and we stop in the little place, Kotopo. 20,000 people, lakeside, plenty of fresh water, no high rise buildings and eight exits. This is, suits us just fine. <laughs> but we don't know anybody and not only that, I don't have a business, I'm just some guy now with a family trying to figure out what I'm gonna do with my future. So I do what I do best, what I enjoy doing best. I, lo I go out and meet people and say hi and what do you do and what do you do? And I end up discovering that there's some significant technologies in, um, in Topol. Not only is there geothermal, but there's also um, GNS Science, which is the New Zealand Geological and uh, uh, geological and uh, um, nuclear science, thank you very much. So here we are, we've got a business called Geoacoustics, and I'm gonna run through and tell you what Geoacoustics is now. Geoacoustics is an infrasound generator, and the reason that's important is that it allows us to create a data stream that we can control, that we can look for, because infrasound is very quiet. Infrasound, to search for infrasound that we want is like, um, how would you say, trying to listen to somebody sing um, humming in a record uh, at a rock concert. So we need to create data so we can actually understand what we're looking for. Secondly, the other important thing about geoacoustics is its unique sensor arrays. And we can create large arrays and we can see those events over a large area of land. Thirdly, we've got unique digital signal processing and that allows us to pitch shift the audio from the infrasound up to the audible range. And that's important because the mind and the ear is actually the most, still one of the most advanced ways that we can actually detect sound and understand it. And fourthly, we've got this incredible technology where we can take the data from our sensors, which is traditional sort of seismic looking data, and actually create real infrasound movies of showing infrasound propagation over the land. But we can do more than just that. We can now create exclusion zones for the aviation industry, which is significantly impacted by birds. And in actual fact, hundreds of people have died since the late 80s because of bird strike. We can create safety zones, for the, as I said, for the aviation industry. We can also, um, in real terms, with our infrasound generators, mimic the sound characteristics of potential wind farms. And with our using our acoustic camera technology, recalibrate them just by understanding that environment better so we can reduce infrasound and other noise levels over wind farms. But everything with mass actually has a resonance, whether it be a small cell or whether it be a large body. So we hope to be able to put our infrasound generators into large structures and actually see with little sensors how they vibrate and maybe we might be able to understand those structures more in real terms and hopefully make them a little bit safer. Now, you probably get an idea of who I am, so this one's really close to my heart. What I wanna do is get a whole lot of these infrasound generators understand how they work with our acoustic camera, aim them to a side of a mountain, and see if we can't potentially loosen some of that snow. <laughs> now, it's, I mean, yeah, it's science, but it's also very cool, because the, possi <laughs> the possibility of being able to create a way in which snow may not reside too thickly on a mountainside, not having to have people just walking with long prods and explosions, that could be, be potentially a lifesaver. But infrasound doesn't just affect 
our environment, it can also affect the way that we understand our environment. So we're doing an experiment with, um, hopefully with AUT next year, by putting our, they've got some amazing technology where they can use satellites to accurately understand the positioning of our land. And when there's a, a, an event from the sun millions of miles away, uh, that event is usually a, a corona mass ejection. So we have ionized particles traveling across the universe bouncing off our ionosphere. Our ionosphere sort of moves and creates pressure waves onto the land. And so hopefully with our geoacoustic technology, we might be able to show, show some correlation between what's happening with the sun and our atmosphere and with the land. I mean, it may not work, we don't know, but you've got to try. And for me, that's what interests me. I'm interested in doing things that have never been done before or somebody says that it can't be done. And if usually if somebody says something's impossible, it's usually either lack of imagination or it just means we don't have enough knowledge. It doesn't mean it's not necessarily possible. So this is who I am. I enjoy doing this type of stuff. The problem is for some people, it's a challenge. And every time you try and push boundaries, you're gonna create challenges. So I'm gonna continue making mistakes. I'm definitely gonna continue, you know, st either stretching relationships or stretching uh, environments or stretching possibilities because I wanna do things. I wanna see what's possible. But I can guarantee you one thing, I'm gonna keep doing really cool shit with amazing people. <laughs> Thank you.